So welcome, welcome to this public lecture from the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford. My name is Ian Shipsy. To the online audience, you are all muted. Please write your questions into the chat window and we will select some of them at the end of the talk for Chris to answer. The topic of this lecture is a remarkable mathematician, Eminova. It will be delivered by a remarkable physicist, Chris Quigg, a distinguished scientist emeritus at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Chris is one of the world's most eminent theoretical particle physicists. Following his undergraduate degree at Yale, he took his PhD at Berkeley under J.D. Jackson. He was an associate professor at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Stony Brook, and then was head of the theoretical physics department at Fermilab for 10 years. His research ranges over many areas of particle physics, from electroweak symmetry breaking and supercollider physics to heavy quarks and the strong interaction among them, all the way to ultra high energy neutrino interactions. The essential interplay between theory and experiment is a guiding theme of his work. Because revolutionary new discoveries are enabled by revolutionary new instrumentation, Chris helped to define the future of particle physics and the new accelerators that will take us there from the super collider to the Tevatron and now to the Large Hadron Collider itself. Accordingly, much of his current research is linked with the experimental program at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, with special attention to the problem of electroweak symmetry breaking. He also maintains an active interest in quarkonium and the new mesons recently associated with quarkonium. Chris has been recognized for his research in numerous ways. Among them, he was a recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship in the early days of his career, and was then elected a fellow of the American Physical Society sometime later. In 2011, he, with Esther Eichton, Ian Hinchcliffe, and Kenneth Lane, was awarded the American Physical Society's J.J. Sakurai's Prize for Theoretical Particle Physics, the highest honor for a theoretical particle physicist or theoretical physicist in the United States. For their work, separately and collectively, to chart a course of the exploration of the TEV scale of physics using multi-TEV hadron colliders. I can say that at a personal level, he inspired several generations of physicists to build that revolutionary new instrumentation, both the detectors and the Large Hadron Collider itself, and look for the Higgs, and once discovered, to study it in detail at the LHC. Chris is also a renowned author and lecturer. His most recent book, Grace in All Simplicity, Beauty, Truth, and Wonders on the Path to the Higgs Boson and the New Laws of Nature, with co-author Robert Kahn was published just in November last year. And there have been rave reviews in Nature and in Science to quote, an enthralling and accessible account of humanity's quest to make sense of our physical world, told through interwoven tales of inspiration, tragedy, and triumph. This afternoon, we are privileged to have Chris Quigg with us to tell us about the remarkable mathematician, Emmy Nova. Please welcome Chris Quick. Well, thank you, Ian, for that exaggerated um, introduction. If my mother were still living, she'd be very pleased by, <laughs> to hear, hear all of that. And thanks to all of you for coming today um, to hear about Emmy Nova. On the 29th of July in 1918, Felix Klein gave a speech to the Royal Mathematical Academy of Sciences in, uh, in Göttingen. 
The paper that he read had been dedicated to him by a young colleague on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of his doctorate, the golden doctorate as the Germans called it. The centennial of that paper occurred therefore five and a half years ago and that was the occasion for my taking an interest in this subject and trying to learn enough to bring some culture to my colleagues at Fermilab, a great institution, but one that specializes in particle physics. And so my colleagues are particle physicists, accelerator physicists, technicians, engineers, and so on. We don't have the luxury of historians, mathematicians, and people of culture. Uh, so that got me into this. And thereafter, you know, like any research problem, you start pulling a thread and it wraps itself around you and what can you do? So I'll tell you uh, something of what I've, I've learned about this. So everybody's heard of Felix Klein because of what's called the Klein bottle. This uh, two-dimensional generalization or maybe one-dimensional gener generalization of the Mavius strip. Originally, I mean, not named by him, but originally named by others, the Kleinische Fläche, meaning Klein and Klein's surface. But Fläche looks like Plasche to people who don't speak German. And so it became the Klein bottle and the name is, uh, the rest is history. So that was, uh, that was Klein. It was a busy week and we'll talk about the, the paper that he, he uh, reported. It was a busy week in uh, Göttingen. So the, this is the, uh, the title of the paper that he gave. I mean, Noether is the author of that. Throughout the PDF, which you'll be able to download, there are lots of links so you can follow up on what you see there and learn more about various topics. So this is the title page of her paper, which we'll see in just a minute in English. And here's a photograph of Emmy from about that time. A week before, Klein had given his own paper to one of the mathematical groups around Göttingen, which was described, described work. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Described work that he had done with um, David Hilbert. They were puzzling over Einstein's general theory of relativity in which the well-known to all of us concept of the conservation of energy doesn't look like a constraint. It looks like an identity. And this seemed weird to them. So they were trying to, uh, to figure it out. The paper that you see here uh, is, is one in which they were explaining what they had understood up to that point. In fact, the reason that they invited Emmy Noether to Göttingen was that they thought she could help them think through this problem. And to some considerable degree, that was so. So his partner was David Hilbert, uh, who you can see really knew how to dress. What students should know is that the portrait of David Hilbert shown there is from a postcard that one of the bookstores in Göttingen sold, a series of uh, postcards that they sold. So the students in Göttingen could either say to their parents or to their school colleagues at different universities, these are the famous people that I'm associating with. And Hilbert took it to a high degree because of his ability to dress extravagantly. Uh, Hilbert is one of the mathematicians that physicists, of course, know as well. But that same week, uh, Emmy Noether had been permitted not to address the Distinguished Royal Academy, but a lesser academy of mathematics, because she was a woman, she was young, and did, she didn't have the standing to present her own work, but she did present a little outline of it um, a few days before Hilbert gave the full version of her work. So here on the right, you see the beginning, be, beginning of what I think is the, uh, the most authentic and most readable translation of Noether's famous paper from 1918, uh, which is contained in a, paper, in a book by Yvette uh, Kotzmann Schwarzbach. And it's really very well done. And the, and the explanation of the theorems is uh, extraordinar extraordinarily well done there. 
underlined here is the essence of what Emmy Noether tried to do. She combined, by thinking about the laws of nature, she combined the calculus of variations, what physics students learn as the Euler-Lagrange equations, with concepts from group theory and symmetry. And from those was able to derive quite remarkable results. So I show you first the results translated from German, but not translated from mathematics, uh, as she wrote them down. And we'll elaborate these in a language that's more and more approachable for all of us. So the first one, there are two theorems. The first one says, if the integral i is invariant under a finite continuous group g sub rho with rho parameters, then there are rho linearly independent combinations among the Lagrangian expressions that become divergences. And conversely, that implies the invariance of the integral under a group g sub rho. So it's both backwards and forwards. And that's a very important point about the proof that she was able to give. The second one, as I said, we'll translate these into intelligible, intelligible language in just a moment. If the integral is invariant under an infinite continuous group, depending on rho arbitrary functions, not parameters, and their derivatives up to order sigma, where sigma can be anything, then there are row identities among the Lagrangian expressions and their derivatives up to an order sigma. Here as well, the converse is valid. So even before we understand what these are saying, you can see that there's no restriction to only deal with a uh, subset of possible equations that have only no derivatives and then no one derivative, but it's really remarkably general. The first one includes the famous theorems of quantum mecha of, of mechanics, classical mechanics, the conservation laws that we know. And the second, and this is very important conceptually, can be described as the maximal generalization of general relativity, and the arguments that lead to general relativity in, uh, in, in other settings. So before translating the words, let's talk about the consequences of the first theorem in its first direction. And that is to make a connection between symmetries of the laws of nature and the conservation laws that we know about either from everyday experience or we learned about in high school or college mechanics. Uh, the first of these is that there is a link between the idea that there's no preferred location in space for the laws of nature. The equations can be translated in time, I say in uh, space, shifted in, in space that is intimately connected with momentum conservation, this famous principle that we use in solving for mechanical collisions. In the similar, similar way, the translation in time, the idea that there's no preferred time for the laws of nature leads to energy conservation. The absence of a preferred direction, that the laws of nature look the same forward, backward, up, down, and so on, leads to conservation of angular momentum, the famous demonstration of figure skaters bring their arms in and go faster and faster. And then the last one is sort of weird. It's that uh, you can boost things by an arbitrary amount by taking the laws of nature to a different place, faster or slower than you were going before. And everything cha changes. Everything just moves along with it. Uh, it. This is sometimes called the center of momentum theorem. And it's so ridiculously obvious that nobody ever talks about it. How could it be otherwise? Now, all of these were known at some level before theorem one was published by Emmy Noether. And this in part account, accounts for the fact that people didn't jump up and down as much as we now think they should have. When uh, these results first came out, they looked at it and said, oh yeah, I know something like that. I can de derive this, the only special case that I need without this fancy mathematics. Uh, so theorem one leaks a conservation law with every continuous symmetry transformation. Uh, there was a uh, famous professor of physics at Yale and the Middle Eastern Tech uh, Technological Institute called Fezzer Grosset. He was a very mild mannered man, a genius at uh, applying group theory to physical problems. Um, but in the, despite the fact that he was a mild mannered man, in the introduction to Emmy Noether's collected works, he did jump up and down. And you read what he had to say here. Before Noether's theorem, the principle of conservation of energy was shrouded in mystery. 
leading to the obscure physical systems of Mach and Ostwald. Netter's simple and profound mathematical formulation did much to demystify physics. Well, I was lucky enough to take very advanced courses in mechanics in which I never had to learn the bizarre systems of Mach and Ostwald. Uh, apparently, Fezzi Grisset did have to learn them and was profoundly impressed by the fact that, I think what he was trying to convey there in his own uh, learned language was that before Netter's theorems, these quantities like energy and the definition of energy or momentum and so on were empirical regularities that have been, dis been discovered by painful experimentation and then the mathematization of, of the, uh, the results. And after this, you could see that they came from somewhere. And so if you were to detect a violation of one of these things, it would mean that some symmetry was violated because the theorems go back and forth. And that's very profound and something to be kept in mind about the importance of testing these conservation laws and then drawing implications from what we expect will be the continued success, but might not be. Theorem two, on the other hand, contains the seeds of the theories we use to describe the fundamental interactions, so-called gauge theories. And we'll see how that works. Um, Cian Yang, one of the founders of those kinds of theories, used to like to say, symmetries dictate interactions. And my modern version of that is that function follows form instead of form follows function, which is an architectural dictum. Uh, and it shows how there's a relationship between electromagnetism, the theory of the strong interactions and the others with general relativity, which otherwise appears to stand apart from the laws of nature that we deal with every day in the, in the laboratory. So that is a foundational insight is quite important. And on the way, it partially clarified Klein and Hilbert's issue about energy conservation and general relativity. It took another 40 or 50 years for that issue to be sorted out to the, uh, the satisfaction of most people. Um, no, so let me stop with that. Interestingly, the examples that we've given are very simple, but there are phenomena in nature that are quite amazing and complicated. And one of them is the discovery of solitons, which is disturbances that propagate without changing over great distances. And there's a, the famous charming example of the discovery of a solitary wave in a canal by a Scotsman named uh, John Scott Russell. And he describes riding us on horseback on a canal path and suddenly a boat stopped, but the water in front of it, the lump of water in front of it didn't stop. And in fact, continued with the same shape for miles and miles as he chased it along the canal. So he's much taken with this phenomenon because we know that lumps of water don't tend to stay together, they, they fall apart. Um, so this is a general property of certain nonlinear equations. And you can, if you're a highly competent applied mathematician, you can actually show that these equations and therefore the phenomenon that they describe to very high approximation correspond to an infinite number of conservation laws. And it's that infinite number of conservation laws, too many to keep track of, that account for the integrity of this lump of water as it's going along. It's, very, it's quite fun to, uh, to play with these things, at least to play with the equations. So that's what I've done as a theoretical physicist. Uh, people of a more practical bent have built their own canals and done what they could to collide different waves together and see what they're like. So here's an example of what happens when you collide two or three or four or five of these solitary waves of the water variety with each other. And you see the remarkable property is that they approach each other. The higher one travels faster than the lower one, and so it will overtake it eventually. They disturb each other in a very nonlinear way. And then they go off with the original shapes recovered, but with a phase shift from the trajectory that they were on before. And all of this is due to the conservation laws. Good trick to try to figure out exactly how it's due to the conservation laws. But, uh, so there, there are applications everywhere in physics, not just in simple things that we do in undergraduate laboratories. 
So who was the person who did this? Uh, her full name was Amalia Emmy Nutter. Both her mother and her grandmother were also named Amalia, and so she went by the name of Emmy. She was born in 1882 in Erlangen, which is just north of Nuremberg, which itself is by train an hour north of Munich. Here's Erlangen about the time of her graduation. Uh, so it's a university city of the kind that you see everywhere in Germany, a little simpler now then than it was now. And the great um, hero of Erlangen at the time that Emmy came on the scene was the famous giver of laws, Ohm. Uh, whether he gave one law or three laws is up to you to decide. So he was a, a native of Erlangen and graduated from the university there, the statue of him looking like a giver of laws is from the technical universe, as a matter of fact, although his work was done in Cologne or someplace. So that was the city. And Emmy herself was from a university family. Her father, Max, was a professor of mathematics for many years, a distinguished guy. He worked on algebraic geometry, that is to say, the study of curves on surface, surfaces. He was a member of a basically uncountable number of academies. So either the standards were lower in those days or he was really quite a guy. Um, so he was the professor of math mathematics uh, in Erlangen. Her brothers, she had two brothers who became mathematicians as well. Felix Klein had been in Erlangen and contributed to its notoriety as a center of mathematics. And in fact, they had the charming tradition in those days in German universities that when a professor was hired, he or she, always he, would give an introductory lecture, an inaugural lecture, not just to the math department or to the physics department or the history department, but for the entire faculty that was meant to be intelligible to everyone, rarely was probably. In the case of Klein, he set out a program that became known as, as his Erlangen program. Uh, and then after two years moved on, but his, his idea was that instead of, that he enunciated in this lecture was instead of studying geometry as an exercise in say Euclidean coordinates to study it as an exercise in group the theory or the symmetry of, of shapes, curves and things like that revolutionary at its time. So he moved on and eventually found his way to Göttingen where uh, Emmy Noether got to meet him. There were two other people in Max Noether's circle, physics students, at least over the age of 55, will know about the tables in the center of that. Uh, there are things that we call Klepsch-Gordon coefficients. They have to do with adding angular momenta together. And to my astonishment, there was actually a Mr. Klepsch and a Mr. Gordon. So Klepsch is on the left. He was a collaborator of Max Noether at other universities. And Paul Gordon was a professor at Erlangen and eventually was Emmy Noether's supervisor for her PhD. Uh, in the, the um, memoir that Emmy and her father wrote for Paul Gordon after his death, they described him without complete respect as a maker of algorithms rather than a maker of ideas. So, so uh, Emmy was from this academic family, also one with some aspirations for family advancement. And so she did what uh, other young women in her milieu did in those days, which was to go to a fancy school, not a finishing school, but a serious mm -hmm. academic school, but only for women. And many of the women who graduated from that program, the high school, were certified as she was to become a teacher of foreign languages, a demonstration of culture. And she was in fact certified to be a teacher of English and French. She was not allowed to enroll in the university because she was a girl. She was, however, after making a petition permitted to audit the lectures and to sit in on them. And I'll show you something about that on the next slide. The academic senate had Pro, uh, had announced their judgment that the admission of women to the university 
would overthrow all academic order. Well, we moderns might say, and good for them, but that wasn't the, uh, the situation quite yet. Now, um, we may look back at these old Germans and say, you know, how backward they were. But if you look at some of the universities that we know about, like ones I know about, um, the record is a little mixed. So I was an undergraduate at Yale, as Ian told you. Uh, Yale was a monastery, more or less, when I was there. Women were only admitted as undergraduates in 1969. I was recently back at Yale and the, the undergraduates wanted to know what had changed since you were there, as, you know, since you're a fossil. And I said, well, there were no women then. And they said, well, they've been women for 50 years. That's a long time, but it's recent. It's within the memory of people I know, like me. Uh, the first women doctorates in the US were at Cornell in 1895 and Chicago in 1897. Yale, like some of the other private universities, admitted women for graduate study early on and gave them graduate degrees, but hadn't permitted undergraduate women to join the ranks. So Princeton is just as bad as Yale. They also had the first women they did move together in 1969 as uh, undergraduates. My wife's father was a uh, distinguished professor of English, a Milton scholar at Princeton. And he was terribly opposed to the admission of women. He thought it was going to ruin things. This will re relate to something you told me. But then the women's sports team started winning championships and he decided he had been for it all along. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he wasn't the only old bird who uh, had a conversion of that kind. The state universities often admitted women from their foundation, which was in the 1860s or a little after. Uh, so Berkeley admitted undergraduate women from 1870. The first physics PhD was in 1926, not terribly bad, but the first woman physics PhD to join the faculty as a tenured member was in 1981, somebody I know well. So that's, it's just shocking that it took so long. Okay. Um, Daniela helped me look up some statistics on Oxford. We don't have a complete picture. Uh, you will know that Oxford had women's colleges from 1879, but the women could get honors and things like that, but no degrees until 1920. So Oxford is advanced compared to some of the places in the United States. And I'm told is very proud of being advanced compared to Cambridge, which is <laughs> what the standard should be. Oh, so I want to go back. Okay, so as I said, Emmy Netter was able to petition to go to uh, lectures. And here's the letter that she wrote to do it. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, I guess so this is the way people wrote petitions to the authorities in those days. So she begins, the obedient Emmy Netter, blah, blah, blah. And she explains that not only does she have an interest in these things, but while she was in her girls' school, she was taking private tuition from a couple of mathematics professors. And so she was qualified to understand what she was going to hear. So she was permitted to listen to, to lectures for a while. Um, it's, again, not that things are so perfect today, but it's amazing how backward our ancestors were not that long ago. Uh, in 1903, some universities were moving a little faster, and in particular, Göttingen was slightly more open-minded. So she passed the university qualification in 1903, and she was able to go for a semester to Göttingen, which was Mount Olympus for mathematics. And you know, we'll see on the next page, everybody that you've ever heard of was there or would claim to have been. And in her first semester, she heard lectures from Schwarzschild, Minkowski, Klein, and Hilbert. As I say to my students, if that's your first semester, either you're hooked or your history. <laughs> so luckily for all of us, she was hooked. Um, her 
Erlangen came to its senses, maybe partly because Emmy Nutter's father became dean of the faculty, <laughs> could have been related. And so she was able to enroll, enroll there as a PhD student. And she was, as I've said, a Gordon student. Uh, she, she wrote this uh, computational paper, 331 invariants of quartic interactions, um, which she described by one of the nice German terms that I remember from my childhood in which I was compelled to read Faust, mist, for which the polite translation is dung. Uh, if you've read Faust in any language, you may know that at one point he ends up with, with, with his head in a dung heap. And that was her assessment of her thesis because even by this time as a young mathematician, she wanted to not make calculations, but to have ideas and to invent new concepts. So she looked back, well, you know, she got honors for her thesis, but it wasn't uh, in her mind her greatest work. Uh, she was, as far as one can tell, the second woman to get a PhD, an official PhD in mathematics in Europe. The first was uh, Sofia Kovalevskaya who got her degree in Göttingen with Weierstrass, another famous name, became a full professor in Stockholm and died young uh, in not, not very long after taking up the position. I mean, Erter became an unpaid member of the Erlangen Mathematical Institute. You can imagine that there are all sorts of nepotism rules that however good she was, her father was on the faculty, you couldn't have that. Um, maybe even on average, that's a good rule, but in this case, it's pretty extreme. Luckily for her, there was a new faculty member named Ernest Fisher, who was interested in modern themes in mathematics, and so gave her the courage and the knowledge to start inventing things on her own. And that's where she really found her, her uh, great strength. She was invited in Göttingen to, in 1915, as I said, to help Klein and Hilbert talk through the um, conservation of energy in Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, here is a list from the web page of the Mat Mathematical Institute in, uh, in Göttingen. It really was the center of the universe, Mount Olympic, Olympus, um, Mecca, whatever you will say. Uh, Emmy Nutter's name is even on here now. But even we physicists know essentially every name on this list of things. And in fact, if you are a physicist and you trace your, your heritage back to the beginning of time, all of us are essentially are descended from Gauss because there was nobody else at the time. So propagated in this way. So I have a friend who can't add two and two, who was a descendant of Gauss. And it shows that DNA may not be infallible. Uh, so there she was in Göttingen having a great time with these people and working together. I have not visited Göttingen yet, but I'm told that in the Ma Mathematics Institute, there is a poison cabinet, a gift shrunk up where they keep their treasures. And their treasures include notes from decades of seminars, um, including untold volumes of seminar notes taken by Klein so the whole history of mathematics is contained in those. They are digitized by the Clay Mathematical Institute in Boston, Cambridge. Um, and you can look at them online if you have a lot of time to be impressed by his ability to stay awake in seminars <laughs> and to record them <laughs> in fantastic detail. What a guy. <laughs> okay, so the... Uh, Klein and Hilbert were grateful to her. They had brought her there to help them talk through their problems. And they proposed in 1915 that she'd be able to give a lecture to get her habilitation, which would allow her not to become a member of the faculty, but to give private lectures for which students would pay a trivial amount probably. This was opposed by the faculty. Uh, it first had the support of the local faculty in mathematics and science. But one of the supporting letters came from this character, Edmund Landau, uh, who wrote, I have had up to now uniformly unsatisfactory experiences with female students, and I hold that the female brain is unsuited to mathematical production. Miss Nutter seems to be a rare exception. 
So that's a supporting letter. <laughs> I'm sorry to confess to you that I have not recently, but within my career, read letters of a similar character. It's really appalling. Um, but because he said he was in favor, in spite of these words, they proposed it to the entire faculty, but the historical philological department opposed on the concern that seeing a female organism might be distracting to the students. <laughs> so they held a special vote against her affiliation and she lost. She, on the other hand, under the names of Klein and Hilbert, mostly Hilbert, she was able to give lectures. Uh, there were some financial arrangements made under the table. The first session would happen, Hilbert would come and say, here I am, the great professor Hilbert, my assistant, Dr. Nutter will take over the class from here. And then he might come back to receive the applause of the masses of the last lecture. And she would do all the work, which gave her an opportunity both to earn a little uh, money, but also to develop her ideas because uh, she was famous for announcing unformed programs of uh, mathematical research in her lectures. And this might have been challenging for the students, but it was very good for the development of mathematics as it happened. So then Klein and Hilbert decided they had a brilliant idea. They informed the authorities that she was about to be stolen away by Frankfurt, to which they got this response. It's anybody who's ever dealt with the Dean has received something that is as brilliantly reasoned as this. With regard to accepting women to teaching positions, the regulations of Frankfurt University are identical to those of all the universities. Women are not allowed to be appointed to positions of external lecturers. This therefore, so can't make it a, uh, an exception in your case. And never fear, Frankfurt can't steal her either because we're gonna have the same rules for them. So that was another rejection Klein and Hilbert had to try again. After she had written the famous paper, what we now think of the, the famous paper, and because Germany had lost a war, the Weimar Republic came in, they got rid of some, lots of the old restrictions, women had a better place in society than they had before. They tried again, and this time they were able to grant her the habilitation on the basis of her famous paper, Famous for Physicists. Now, around the same time, 1918 was when she did this work, published the work. Hermann Weyl thought he could make a theory of everything in modern parlance, that is to say, a theory of all the fundamental interactions then known, of which there were two, gravitation and electromagnetism. Gravitation was described by Einstein's theory, which you can see has to do with symmetries and general coordinates and variants and stuff like that. And Weyl's notion was maybe you could say that if you made a, the laws of nature not changing, invariant when you change the ticks on a measuring, law, law, ro, measuring rod, a yardstick, or the interval between ticks of a clock, and impose that on the equation of nature, maybe you'd have a, a theory of both gravity and electromagnetism. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work partly because it wasn't the right idea. One needed to invent quantum mechanics and recognize the existence of complex numbers in order to make a possible theory. But it was an idea along these lines. Um, that went, there were, was a lot of back and forth with other people. Einstein pointed out that according to Weyl's first idea, the path that a particle took in going around from here to there would influence the outcome. And that doesn't make sense. When you get back to the starting point, it ought to behave the same as it did before. And then quantum mechanics came along and various people said, uh, look here, Vial, you just need to apply your brilliant insight to the quantum mechanical phase instead of to rulers and, uh, and clocks. So it is an arcane but straightforward application of the ideas contained in Nerdus theorem. Interestingly, Weil in 1955 said that the strongest arguments for my theory seem to be this, the gauge invariance corresponds to the principle of conservation of electric charge 
as the coordinate invariance corresponds to the conservation law of energy and momentum. So seeing the parallel between one symmetry based on quantum mechanical wave functions and another symmetry that we talk about for the ordinary laws of mechanics, all from, all contained in, uh, in Noether's theorem. So how do we know that electric charge is conserved? There are many experiments that look for the decay of the lightest charged particle, the electron. And the most uh, telling thing that we've been able to think of so far is to look for an electron decaying into a photon and a neutrino, two neutral particles, so that charge would disappear. And there are fantastic limits on this that give you a lifetime of greater than 10 to the 28 years for this decay. So we can't say it doesn't happen, although we kind of suspect it doesn't happen, but it takes a very long time. 10 to the 28 years is much, much, much longer than the age of the universe. So for all practical purpose, purposes, it is certainly true that uh, electric charge is conserved. So I'll skip a little interlude on how we know that should be so. Um, her paper that we celebrate in uh, 2018 was what we call a sleeping beauty in the physics literature. It made some, a splash in general relativity because of the connection with uh, the conundrums that Klein and Hilbert were going after, but it did make such a, a splash in physics in general because after Hermann Weyl's application, which remember he came, up, came at it in a sort of circuitous way, there was nothing else to apply it to. No other symmetries, no other quantum numbers that people could apply this, uh, this logic to. And so it took a long time for it to, uh, to be taken very seriously and to be recognized as a really foundational principle. Werner Heisenberg was a big believer in symmetry. He's the person who noticed the similarity between protons and neutrons, particles that differ by charge, have almost the same mass, and they enunciated the principle of isotopic spin together with others. He should have known that that was something you could apply in Noether's theorem to. So in a um, interview, a staged interview with his disciples late in life, uh, he announced his behavior, his uh, deep belief in symmetry. In the beginning was the symmetry. That is certainly more correct than the Democritean thesis. In the beginning was the particle. The elementary particles embody the symmetries. They are their simplest representations, but they are only a consequence of symmetries. So here's a man who believes in symmetries. He confessed to an interviewer later on that he didn't think he'd ever seen Noether's paper. We don't know if he had, whether he'd known what to make of it, but there was just this disconnect. And it's, it's all the more surprising, I think, from the modern point of view, that the people inventing quantum mechanics quantum mechanics were largely in Göttingen. I mean, Eder was in Göttingen, and there was all this ferment that somehow the connections weren't made. It's partly because the right, all the right concepts weren't, weren't uh, invented at the same time. So Isospin came in 1932, 33 or so, long after the Göttingen circle was breaking up. Anyway, very interesting. And a, a lesson for all of us We've all had the experience, anybody with any, uh, any time in, in uh, research has had the experience of hearing an idea, it goes sailing over your head, you have no idea what it's good for. And then a few years later, you independently have that idea and somebody says, you stole my idea. <laughs> or that we see an idea, our own or somebody else's that apply, is applied to a problem, it doesn't work. It's not the right solution to that problem. But if we have memories and remember that technique, that strategy, there may come a problem for which it is a perfect solution. And that's why we have libraries and memories and colleagues. Okay, um, so pretty mysterious that, uh, that this didn't have more of a, of a splash, but that's the way it was. Another thing that is astonishing to me, because the connection between translation and time and energy conservation once you've seen it in uh, classical mechanics and then more generally in Noether's theorem, would tell you that you don't fiddle around by saying energy is not conserved. And yet, one of the gods, Niels Bohr, did that not once, but twice. Uh, first, he speculated with other distinguished people that in 
Compton scattering, the scattering of a photon from electrons. And this is the, the experiment that convinced people that photons, particles of light were real. Maybe energy was only conserved statistically. Well, eventually somebody measured the energies coming in and coming out and found that they were, it was conserved. But he dared to do that. And then more famously, anybody who knows about neutrino physics will know that there was a problem in, of the um, spectrum of electrons and radioactive beta decay that according to the idea that it decayed into a nucleus decayed into another nucleus and an electron, the electron should have had a definite energy. And in fact, the energy was smeared out. It only went up to the, that end point. That led to the conjecture of the neutrino, which turned out to be true. But there was Bohr again saying, well, you know, our law of the conservation of energy applies on the human scale, but maybe when we go down to the subatomic scale, it doesn't apply anymore. If he had read Netter's theorem, at least he should have been a little stressed by having this revolutionary <laughs> idea, because it really means that you're overthrowing something that one should hesitate to overthrow. We should challenge everything, of course, but we should know when we're on thin ice. But we forget for he, he did some, he had a, a good year or two uh, in his career. Uh, so finally, in 1936, he decided that he had been misguided. Okay, well, what happened to Emmy Noether? She fulfilled her desire to do creative mathematics and became known as the mother of modern algebra. She invented things called rings and ideals, generalizations of our ordinary arithmetic. And there she was in this uh, great center of mathematics, Göttingen, and she was the one accreting all the students and postdocs because she was just so full of ideas. Uh, there are stories from Gettingen about this band of ruffians known as Nitter's Boys and Nitterknaben who would go marauding through the streets of Erlangen shouting about mathematics and they'd go around and they'd go around again and they got more and more rowdy and this wasn't the way people were supposed to behave in a university town. I don't know whether you have any ruffians here in Oxford, but uh, if they're mathematicians, leave them alone. They may, do, they may be doing great stuff. So she was really the person who accumulated all the, these people. Um, she got to be a sort of extraordinary or adjunct professor after a time. She spent a year in Moscow. She had very good friends and, and collaborators in Moscow, a year in, in Frankfurt. Finally, in the early 30s, she be began to get recognition for her work in inventing modern algebra um, and received with her partner, uh, that is a man who was simultaneously and also in Göttingen most of the time doing the same kind of work. So they were creating together uh, a fancy award from the uh, Mathematical Society. And she was the first woman allowed to give a plenary lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians. It was a big thing. She was also uh, an editor. She was a good citizen. She was an editor of one of the leading mathematical journals. Her male colleagues referred to her with as a, an expression of respect, they came, they claim, dare nurture with the masculine rather than in the feminine. So, you know, it's true she wasn't much of a looker, but if you look at these guys, as, uh, apart from Hilbert in his fancy clothes, they weren't lookers either. So this is just male chauvinism gone wild. Uh, but she seemed to bear all this uh, with extraordinary equanimity. She had a great sense of humor. She would bake cakes, have parties for people. And as I say, the students followed her rather than anybody else. So pretty amazing. Okay, then came 1933 with the new regime. And with the new regime came new rules. So there's a headline from the local newspaper. And the choice of words is interesting because the Urlaubt sort of sounds like they were sent on vacation, but they were rusticated. They were basically fired. Uh, so six professors, <laughs> were fired from the university or expelled from the university, including four people that we know about. Felix Bernstein was one of the inventors of biostatistics. Max Born was Max Born, who gave the uh, statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics and had himself uh, a 
a band of, of extraordinary students. Richard Courant was the famous uh, collaborator of Hilbert on the methods of mathematical physics, also the father of two physicists that I've known, and one of them, uh, one of the greatest accelerator physicists ever, uh, another your former colleague who was uh, an experimental physicist, good guy in his own right, and Emmy Noether. There is an interesting uh, article by Saunders McLean, who was there as a postdoc during the Nazi era about what it was like to be around at that time. And McLean is one of the people who basically transcribed the lectures of Emmy Noether and Emile Artine so that ordinary mortals could understand them, from which I learned some of the subject. Uh, then there came a letter from the minister uh, in September saying, we're not fooling around, you're really fired. And at this point, uh, so her wages would be, as such as they were, would be ceased at the end of September 1933. So it became clear it was time to get out of town. Emmy Nutter had three possibilities. One was from her friend Pavel Alexandrov in Moscow, which he considered seriously, it appeared, that they would be able to set up a whole institute for her there. And she had, in addition to Alexandrov, a number of close colleagues in, in Moscow. So that was a temptation. But as best I can tell, it couldn't be arranged quite in time. The second possibility was down the street here at Somerville College, where she had an inv invitation to come. Um, there's a very interesting recent article by Kate Kitagawa that you could is linked to here, which in which she's found in the Western Library all sorts of documents about this and filled out the history of it. The long and short of it was that the off offer that was presented to her in which she accepted was for one semester, but then there was uh, you know lack of communication and the world was being turned upside down and so it never happened. At one point she thought of coming here for a semester and then going to take to the United States to take the office offer that she eventually did. And that offer was at uh, Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia, a beautiful suburban area with little hills and valleys. Part of the attraction to uh, Bryn Mawr, which is not one of the great centers of learning, but was and is an important women's college in the United States with a great tradition, not only for high level education, but for high level education in mathematics and sciences, which distinguished it from some of the other seven sisters, as they're called in the United States. Um, and part of the attraction there was once a week, they arranged for her to go to Princeton, where the Institute for Advanced Study was forming, and where some of her German friends were, all, were escaping to. So one can ask why the Institute for Advanced Study didn't make a place for her. It's complicated. It was originally located on the campus of Princeton University, which as she testified was very hostile to anything that was not a male. Um, but they also had a lot of people to deal with who were refugees in various fields. It is claimed that they were trying to set something up during her second year at, uh, at Bryn Mawr. Anyway, she did go there and take her students. Bryn Mawr also uh, made available some fellowships. So in addition to the undergraduate math majors, uh, she would be able to have some graduate students who went on to real careers in, in uh, mathematics. They decided that despite her certified facility in the English language, that maybe undergraduate teaching was not for her. And so she did not have to teach undergraduates, but had this, these few fellows and uh, graduate students who became the Nutter girls instead of the Nutter boys. So smaller in number. And I don't know if they were actually ever characterized as ruffians, but there are stories about them going around Bryn Mawr. Not, it's, there's hard, I, that at the time there was hardly a town there, I think, but there are you know, fences to go over and hills and valleys to go through. And so they were going around and one of her, her male colleagues in Gettingen said the only way he could understand what she was trying to say was to take her around the same loop at least three times because then she'd start to be short of breath and would speak slowly enough that he could understand what she was trying to say. <laughs> anyway, so uh, by all accounts, she, uh, she had a great time in 
Bryn Mawr, but only for a year and a half, because in the uh, spring of her second year, she had, it's interesting for physicists to follow historical writings because they're all very definite and they don't all agree. So she had something going on in her stomach. It was a cyst, it was a tumor, who knows? She had an operation. Uh, there was bleeding, there was sepsis, who knows? As I say, they're all very definite. Uh, in any event, suddenly she died in the spring of, uh, of 1935 after only a year and a half in Bryn Mawr and before whatever the Institute for Advanced Study was contemplating could come into being. So here's a death notice from the uh, university. Einstein sent an appreciation to the New York Times. Uh, it's worth reading in full. Someone who's had access to the, uh, the archives at the Institute for Advanced Study let me know that probably Hermann Weil was moving Einstein's hand in writing this. You've seen the, trans the original German versions back into English, back into German and so on. Anyway, this is published a few days later in the New York Times and it's fairly effusive, um, even if there are, are uh, vestiges of chauvinism. Uh, so he talks about what a great math mathematician she was, how uh, he goes into poetic detail about what it means to create mathematics. But there's this line that says she was the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far <laughs> produced since the higher education of women began. It sounds like it could have been nicer than that. Uh, there was a memorial service about which Hermann Weil went on for a very long time with a great hymn to her achievements as a physicist, as a mathematical physicist and as a founder of mathematics. And the, um, as I say, she was known as the mother of, of modern algebra, which is quite an achievement for anyone. Uh, Bryn Mawr has not, there's no statue of Emmy Nutter in Bryn Mawr. There is a little painting in the math department, but the main thing that you see is a marker in the cloister uh, under which it is claimed her ashes are preserved. With initials, not even a full name. So you can walk by that and not know you know, it could be this way is east, that way is north, or something like that. Uh, so I'll close with a couple of uh, recollections from her, her friends. Vile says, I have a vivid recollection of her when I was in Göttingen as a visiting professor in the winter semester of 1926-27 and lectured on representations of continuous groups. She was in the audience for just at that time, the hypercomplex number systems and their representations had caught her interest. And I remember many discussions when I walked home after the lectures. This shows how annoying she could be because of her devotion to mathematics. With her and von Neumann, who was in Göttingen from, as a Rockefeller fellow, through the cold, dirty, rain-wet streets of Göttingen, they just want to get out of the rain and she wants to talk about mathematics. So we all would benefit from having colleagues like this, even if they drove us a little bit crazy. When I was called permanently to go again in 1930, I earnestly tried to obtain from the ministerium a better position for her because I was ashamed to occupy such a preferred position be beside her who I knew to be my superior as a mathematician in many respects. So that's pretty serious. Alexandrov talks about what a sweet person she was, how generous she was to her stu students and how in her lectures, courses of lectures, attended by a small cluster of students and maybe faculty members visiting mathematicians, she would lay out programs of research in modern algebra and then be delighted when her followers carried them out, would help them write the introductions to the articles, but would never put her name on the papers. So a person of great generosity and uh, immensely creative. Uh, Bartel van der Werden is one of the people who transcribed the lectures of uh, Artin and Nerter. And he has a statement here that is, I think, made with genuine sympathy and not to undercut her, but describes what it was like. The entirely non-visual and non-calculative mind of hers, a reaction to her thesis, I think, was probably one of the main reasons why her lectures were difficult to follow. She was without didactic talent 
and the touching efforts she made to clarify her statements, even before she had finished pronouncing them, by rapidly adding explanations, tended to produce the opposite effect. And yet, how profound the impact of her lecturing was. Her small, loyal audience, usually consisting of a few advanced students and often a faithful number of professors and guests, had to strain enormously in order to follow her. Yet those who succeeded gained far more than they would have from the most polished lecture. So a real source of inspiration for other people and somebody who took great delight in their working out the program. Well, in physics, we talked about Aaron Biles' idea eventually evolving into the theory of quantum electrodynamics and the application of a symmetry, a local symmetry, position-dependent symmetry to the quantum mechanical wave, wave function. In 1954, Xian Yang and Robert Mills made a generalization. Finally, uh, 20 years after the invention of isospin, the symmetry between protons and neutrons, that had been validated by seeing that the forces between two protons or two neutrons or a proton and a neutron, once you take away the electromagnetic effects, were the same, and decided that they could try to apply this strategy to isospin symmetry. And what they found, and this is a, a gen generally true statement, is that if you make such, such a construction, you will, you will arrive at a mathematically legitimate looking theory uh, in this case, it's not a legitimate looking theory of this world because they interpret, it, it gives a prediction that there will be charged force particles and neutral, a neutral force particle that would mediate the nuclear interaction, but which would have zero mass, infinite range, and so wouldn't account for the fact that nuclei have a finite size. So it's a wrong theory, but a brilliant stroke and a generalization, not of her theorem, but of the way physicists had applied the theorem. And this has grown into um, the theories that we have today of the strong and electroweak interactions. In the case of the strong interaction, there's a theory just like this, in which the, uh, the symmetry is what we call the color symmetry among quarks of different kinds. And there it's kosher to have massless particles, have all sorts of mag magnificent properties that quarks, if you look at them, uh, very quickly look like they're free particles, but you can't pull them apart. They live inside protons and neutrons. It's a theory called quantum chromodynamics, which is uh, one of the dramatically successful new laws of nature that we talk about in the subtitle of our, our book. And the other that's a bit more, bit more complicated is to base the theory of the weak electromagnetic interactions in part on a symmetry that's like the isospin symmetry between proton and neutron but this time applied to say the electron and the neutrino. Um, interestingly, I, a student at Cambridge University named Ron Shaw made the same construction at about the same, same time. Um, in spite of the fact that Yang and Mills, when they presented their theory at the Institute for Advanced Study, were roundly criticized by uh, Wolfgang Pauli and others because their force particles were massless and that didn't make any sense. They sensed that they had a good idea, as subsequent events have uh, borne out. On the other hand, people discouraged uh, Ron Shaw from publishing his. It's, it's a chapter, the nth chapter of his thesis. And he went off to a quiet life rather than a celebrated life. He be became a professor at the University of Hull. And he, I give you a link there to a memoir that uh, Michael Atiyah wrote about uh, Shaw after his death. As far as you can tell, and Shaw had a blog that you can look at, he was pretty happy with his life in the countryside and didn't mind that he hadn't uh, gotten recognition for this. So that's, the, uh, that's where we are today, that these, these ideas that go back to 1918 and took a long time for people to notice as key tools that we could use to build theories of the world are finally recognized and are the basis of almost everything we do today. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you.